previously on The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I am Rachel Luna, the host of the Permission to Offend podcast, creator of the Faith Activated Journaling Experience, and the founder of the Confidence Activated Live event. Well, in order to be successful, you really have to have courage because it takes a lot of courage to do anything that we're doing in the online space. Like marketing takes courage. So equal means everybody has the same thing. Equity means everyone has what they need. And we need to make sure that everyone is getting what they need to thrive. It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. I'm Australian and I'd like to acknowledge our traditional custodians of country where I live and work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge our continuous connection and contribution to land, sea and community. So if you are already on Clubhouse, we have the Psychology of Entrepreneurship Club that we regularly run amazing panels and events. Follow me at Ronsley on Clubhouse to see when the events are being done. There's no better way to do this, unfortunately. But we just finished one called Solving the World's Most Meaningful Problems that had Naveen Jain and Darren Olin, amongst other human beings, uh, on that panel. So you've got to come and check it out. It's like nothing I've ever experienced before. And if you have an iOS device but don't have an invite, email us, kaylee at amplifyagency.media. Email us your phone number and we can arrange to send you one of my seven invites that I have left. So enough about Clubhouse. Let's get to today's guest. I've always wanted to interview an artist, like a real artist. Today, I get my chance. Check this out. Listen to his voice first. The compulsion to create, it is irresistible in me. Like I can't, I can't fight it. It has to come out. And so if it can't come out in what I would say the conventional ways, the ways that I would like, it's still going to come out in some kind of way. And so, yes, it does. It does challenge me to be creative in how I am creative. <laughs> His name is George Wilkerson. And I asked him about how he gets into the headspace to create. Well, it's not methodical, uh, but I do have, I guess, like little rituals <laughs> Uh, that I do to like create an environment for myself emotionally and mentally and physically that's conducive to uh, creation. And so like right now I have a poet, a poem laid out on my bed, for example, and I'll just like walk you through the process as quickly as possible. So about a week ago I was looking at a magazine and part of the magazine uh, contains photography. And there is just this really poignant picture uh, of these cows standing in the road, staring at the camera. And it's kind of dark behind them, and the cattle look menacing, and it just creates just this weird, um, surrealistic mood. And I was like, whoa. I said, I just had a powerful response to this photo. I'd like to write a poem about this. I would like to recreate this feeling uh, for a reader in a poem. And so in order to do that, I said, well, I need to clear my plate. I've got letters to do. I have deadlines. I have to meet other things. You know, I've got to exercise. I've, I've just got all these other little minor responsibilities, and I have to wipe all that out of the way because I need to be able to devote my full attention to this mood that I'm trying to replicate because I have to sort of go into that zone. I have to block everything else and seclude myself and just sort of turn inward and connect myself to that moment and that feeling and just sit there while this small little sliver of me comes back out to this side of the world and holds the pen and writes what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing and just pouring it out on the paper and trying to make those little connections, those little things that add up to me feeling what I'm feeling. Uh, and so that's how I do a poem. You know, then after I do that, I come back out to this side and 
I sit with it and I read it and I reread it and uh, I see if it makes me feel the way that that picture felt. Uh, and if it doesn't, I have to go back in and make adjustments. Uh, and I have to just sit with that moment, though, uh, for as long as possible. Just just dwell in it and uh, just sort of move back and forth between this side and that side, this side and that side, uh, until I make them match as perfectly as possible. While George was talking, I thought to myself, I wonder if people misunderstand his art. I wonder if people judge art even before they have actually witnessed or interacted with that art. Sometimes they see the art and the biases and the lens of that bias that we layer over viewing that art can mean... We're all different. Um, we're all unique individuals. In, in some ways, there are some universal qualities to all of us. But in other ways, like we're, we're like universes in and of ourselves. We're like self-contained universes. And so when I create a piece of art, um, I can't really make it for other people. I can try to target the universal qualities that we all share, but ultimately I'm creating it uh, in alignment with an inner experience that I have, my inner aesthetic or my uh, emo my mood at that moment. And I'm just trying to be true to that and let the art that I've created mirror that inner experience. Uh, but I go into it also knowing that when an audience or anyone views it or engages with it, they're probably not going to experience it the exact same way that I did. They're not going to get everything about it. But if they can get a big piece of it, you know, the main takeaway or whatever that I aimed at, then usually I'm satisfied with that. But, you know, generally speaking, almost everything that I create is misunderstood to some degree. It's just a matter of degree. A study has found that artists have structurally different brains than non-artists. Participants' brain scans revealed that artists had increased neural matter in areas relating to fine motor movements and visual imagery. The research published in NeuroImage suggests that an artist's talent could be innate, but training and environmental upbringing also play crucial roles in their ability, the authors report. As in many areas of science, the exact interplay of nature and nurture remains unclear. Okay. So being misunderstood was a valid question because George Wilkerson is on death row. And you remember Tessie, Tessie Castillo from volume 64. This is her remembering how she met George for the first time. George is the only one of my co-authors that I've never met, actually. Uh, he was not in the original class in the prison that I was teaching. And... I never, I got kicked out before I got to see him. So the only way that we connected was through Chantan, because once I had been writing to them for a while, Chantan said, oh, I have this other friend. He's a writer. He really wants to get to know you. Can he write to you also? And I said, okay. And you remember Chantan, Terry Robinson from volume 63? I am currently fighting a wrongful conviction. And it's not something that I, I say lightly because I understand the stigma um, in institutions behind people who, behind claims of innocence. But that doesn't take away from the fact that throughout my life, I have engaged in a lot of poor choice and a lot of um, um, ill behavior. Um, I was a criminal. I did sell drugs. Um, at 17 years old, the charge that I was locked up for was snatching a woman's pocketbook. Like I had learned from this older guy, um, and, like this was the quick way to make money. And I was so naive. I was so... Um, I guess, infatuated um, and influenced by this person that I tried my hand. And it certainly did work for me, and I'm glad because that was like the end of my uh, pocketbook snatching days. But looking back over my life, I am accountable um, for a lot of things that I wish I could take back now. But I chalk a lot of it up to um, the human error and the, the, the human circumstance. I mean, we are human. We are prone to error. And unfortunately, a lot of times that includes criminal behavior. And then I get this like 20 page letter from George because he's very prolific. Like this guy is a producer of all things. He's a wordsmith, an incredible writer and will write, you know, 60 pages of material when I only asked for five. Um, and he's an artist. He's an incredible visual artist. I should actually show you something that he's drawn, just so you have an idea of how good he is. It's really remarkable. Uh, and he's also a poet. So he's just this really intensely creative 
person and is always producing and overproducing. <laughs> and if I ask for something like, we're creating a new version of the book now that's going to come out in June. And so I've asked all the guys for new essays. And George is, of course, the first one to get everything to me, sent me twice as much as I asked for. I'm having to like cut down all his essays because they're too long. And then he's sending me poems and like this and that. And he's already gotten me all of the essays, plus he rewrote all of them based on feedback before anyone else has gotten me a single essay. So that's like just George and how he rules. That's just how George rolls. And while I was digesting all this, I asked George how he felt about his prizes and all the awards he won, you know, the stuff he won from prison. Well, uh, it feels pretty good. It's almost like I'm witnessing uh, because this is probably the first real poem that I wrote and it actually won um, first place in an international poetry contest uh, a few years back. And it, I think it was my first attempt to, to see poetry as a way of storytelling, but also as a way of folding in layers of meaning uh, into a tight space because some things we just can't put into words. We can only like put the words beside other words in the hope that people will see behind them and see this bigger thing that they create that the words themselves uh, just can't hold on to. You just have to be able to like, either you get it or you don't. Um, you know, everything can't be explained or reduced. Uh, some things are irreducible. Uh, they just are. Uh, and you just have to bring your humanity to it and empathize and through your empathy understanding will come um and so like this is my first uh, this was my first attempt at just like trying to um harness that lightning i guess this is probably the quote of the interview everything can't be explained or reduced some things are irreducible they just are okay george oh this philosophical george I would love if you could read us your award-winning poem, please. This poem is called At the Zoo. A crowd of people, clenched together like a fist, walk by jabbing and hooking fingers at the glass, whispering behind hands with nods and shrugs as they openly stare at the spectacle. Showering, playing chess, watching television, men on death row continuing tame lives immune to these intrusions. The crowd snakes forward toward the next exhibit, shaking its head as if disappointed. A red-headed co-ed, seeming sheepish, glances back, and my friend presses against the plexiglass a homeless man's cardboard placard on which he had scrawled his name in two-inch letters and below it, writ me. You misspelled right, you idiot, I say. <clears throat> Good wingman that I am. He flips his sign around to read it, blushing prettily, grinning at our embarrassment. The girl waves goodbye. So George is not just a poet. He is a believer and every artist needs to have this belief. Here is Tessie Castillo again. Also throughout the process of writing the book, George was the, the one of the four who seemed to believe in the process the most. Uh, in the writing of the book. He was um, just had a lot of faith in the process and that, that we were going to be able to do it and that we were going to succeed. And there were many, many moments throughout the four years that we were working on this where there were creative differences between me and the other co-authors or questions about the direction we were going to go. There was a lot of conflict throughout the whole process. And there were many moments when people were quitting or almost quitting, or did quit, uh, including me, even at several points, almost quit. And whenever I considered quitting, it was always George that that held me back from doing that. And it was because he had such a faith in the process. And I felt like the other guys weren't sure whether we were going to succeed anyways. So if I quit, it was like just just feeding into what they already thought about the world, which is what everyone lets everyone lets them down. But George would not let me quit. <laughs> George, 
he was the one who I couldn't face, you know, I wouldn't be able to face him if I quit. Um, so I didn't. And I, I credit my relationship with George and a lot for that. When we come back, they call it the ugly side of art. I'll tell you what it is after these messages. Our aim with this audio documentary has always been to build a strong community of entrepreneurs and creatives to provide a space where they can use their voice to share their authenticity with the world. As a valued listener, your voice matters too. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. So don't be shy to let us know how we're doing in the ratings and comments. If you have a message for our production team or know someone who would be a perfect fit as a guest, you can find out more information on how to share your input at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. Hey, welcome back. Every artist needs to sell and it is called the ugly side of art. And that means that it has to be a business because there's selling involved so that the artist can keep making the art. But every artist struggles with that. You know, from people who are not in, in, involved in the business aspect of it, you know, I mean, we're, we're familiar with it, but for just people in general, uh, art is a business. Uh, we think it's like this, um, uh, this sublime thing that just sort of like happens in a vacuum that, you know, artists, they just spend their time creating art. But when you look throughout history, a lot of the great art was only created uh, because they had the money to create it. They were patronized. Like a lot of the artists were paid very well to create these works of art that we idealize today, the Sistine Chapel or, you know, the Mona Lisa. These were commissioned pieces of art. They weren't just like at home creating art just for the love of art. These were pieces that people paid them to create. And, uh, you know, though, as an artist, as a creative person, you and I are both creative. So even if I'm not getting paid, which 90% of the time I'm not, I still create because of that compulsion. Um, but for people who only focus on the business aspects of it, uh, they could really care less about the compulsion. They're just there to capitalize and make money off of it. Another aspect of art that is just ignored and is not addressed is? A lot of it is through feedback, engagement, direct engagement with the audience. So like what we're doing with Crimson Letters, for example, uh, Tessie is doing a great job of, of um, you know, creating these events of, uh, of the where we can communicate, like, you know, us co-authors who are on the inside can, say, participate in a book club, you know, and as one of the results of the book clubs, uh, as we're working on the second version or the updated version of Crimson Letters, we have asked members of the book club to read some of the advanced material and give us like feedback that we can factor into our revisions. And so in that, and then they're taking it very seriously. And I have to say, this is probably the most intense revision process that I've experienced uh, just because of how hard they're trying to almost doing like line by line uh, critiques and feedback. And so when I read that, I'm seeing from, you know, six or seven different perspectives, like, wow, okay, this is how they took this line. I intended it to mean this thing, and they got that. But just the connotations of that line also triggered these other associations for this reader. Uh, and I can see how they came to that. So how can I rephrase this to either eliminate that association or to enhance it, you know, so I'm literally like writing this, um, trying to factor in 10 or, I mean, you know, multiple perspectives, not 10, but multiple perspectives and hope that these readers, these sympathetic readers sort of represent the audience as a whole, the demographic that we're targeting. But the best thing about art for an artist is, well, I don't think I can do the justice that George can. So George? Over to you, mate. Because every day that I create, I want an audience to engage with it in some way. And, and I think part of that is because I get such a joy from the creative process. So part of it is just for me, uh, just, to, just to, uh, um, to satisfy this compulsion. And I get a joy from the beauty 
of things that I create, things that are beautiful to me. They might not be beautiful to other people, but they're beautiful to me, and I really enjoy them, and I want to share that joy with other people. I like to, like, create just that sense of awe and wonder uh, in other people. And, um, you know, I think people are creative by nature. So, like, with a piece of poetry, for example, poetry for me is more about, like, the juxtaposition of ideas and the way that we say things and and to make connections uh, between things that we typically want to make connections between. Uh, so it helps us to see things in a different way from another perspective uh, and to see how connected, interconnected everything in life really is, even to, like, completely just unrelated things, uh, you know, when you create, like, a good metaphor. And so, like, just to have that new way of seeing something, I want others to see it that way, too. So when I share a poem, I really want them to get it. I really want them to just have this little piece of insight that I got from it. And it's not like a reflection on me. I don't want them to look at me like, oh, wow, you gave me this thing. Uh, you're like this great poet. That's not what I'm looking for is the praise. I'm just wanting them to have this extra little piece of seeing the world, of being able to piece the world together a little bit better, having more of the puzzle, so to speak. Uh, but with a piece of visual art, um, you know, like if I look at the sunset, and this might seem cliche, but if I look at the sunset, just the combination of the colors and the, the vastness of the sky, it just creates this powerful, visceral emotion in me. Like I have this pure, like emotional response when I look at that. And so I want to figure out a way to translate that visually in art uh, in the way that I use lines and contrast and, uh, you know, setting colors side by side. And so like, I'm trying to stay in tune with the way that it makes me feel uh, when I look at the piece of art. And so I'm trying to create like this specific mood and this experience. And when someone else looks at that art, I want them to feel that too. You know, so it's like, hey, I have created this beautiful feeling inside of myself when I created this piece of art and I want to share that with other people. So I guess the audience is always a factor in the equation. So they are important uh, to art for me. An article in Psychology Today discusses the importance of art therapy in prison. It states, art becomes the great equalizer, humanizing those that have been previously dehumanized. Only when someone creates are they recognized as being alive. Art breaches the walls, providing a message to those outside. Specifically, art therapy allows the inmate to express him or herself in a manner acceptable to both inside the prison and the outside culture. You must be thinking, how is he able to do this from death row, from prison, with limitations? By being in here, first of all, I'm, I'm really limited in the competitions that I can participate in. Uh, and that's mostly purely for practical reasons. I don't have access to a computer, for example, so I can't even submit pieces of writing because most places want me to submit it online. Uh, so that just like that just takes me out right right away because it's not about necessarily the quality of the work that I'm creating that's stopping me, but literally just the just the practical aspects of it. Uh, but the incident you're referring to is um, I had entered a poetry contest. So you have some contests that target prisoners in general, but this was not one of those contests. This was open to you know. Anyone in the world that wanted to participate could participate. Not saying there were that many participants, but, uh, you know, it was open to anyone and everyone. So when I went into the contest, when I entered the piece, uh, it was a chat book of poetry. Um, and, you know, they don't know anything about me at the point uh, that I entered the contest. So it wins uh, third, actually. It didn't win first. It won third. And um, I was offered publication. And I ultimately was going to turn down publication because I had a better idea for the, the content. So I wanted to rework the content anyway, but I didn't even get the opportunity to, to say that uh, because when they found out that I was in prison, their main concern was, can you promote this book? Uh, and I didn't really know anything about book promotion at this point. I was like, well, you know, I can't show up to a book event uh, if that's what you're asking. You know, I can't do book signings if that's what you're wanting. And they were like, look, uh, they just told me straight up. They were like, you know, your work is good. It has merits. 
Uh, but we're a business. We're not a charity. We're not in this just for the heck of it. We are in this to make money. And if you can't promote the book, then you can't help us sell it. Then you can't help us make the money off of it. And we're not going to invest uh, ourselves into publishing this book, regardless of its merits. And as hard as that was to accept, I understand where they're coming from and I respect that. Uh, but it was disheartening. Every artist is dealing with limitations of sorts. And it is something that ultimately defines the art. So, George, what kind of stuff do you actually have access to? I don't have access to a lot of the materials to bring some of my ideas to reality. So say, for example, artistically, um, I'd like to paint, you know, so something as simple as painting. I don't have access to paints. I don't have access to canvases or brushes or anything like that. So I'm limited to just pencils and colored pencils and some crappy paper. And if you're an artist, you know how big of a deal paper, just paper itself is, uh, you know, because a pencil interacts with paper in different ways, you know, a cheap piece of paper versus a, a sturdy piece of a, a vellum, you know, the pencil, the way it actually lays down on the paper uh, and smears or shades or the way the paper holds the, the graphite is different for each type of paper. So just little things like that is just really frustrating. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit liberating uh, because I'm challenged to use such a, uh, a sparse amount of materials uh, that it pushes me to do things and to experiment uh, in ways that I wouldn't if I would have had easier access to, to materials. I would have kind of like just stayed within my comfort zone. Um, so, you know, so it's got its, its ups and its downs like anything else. Before we finish, I think you got to hear what Tessie has had to say about George's accomplishments. So he has a lot of accomplishments, writing especially. He's written a memoir. He's written a book of poetry. He's award-winning, nationally award-winning. Um, he has a book of poetry that won a national award, and the prize for winning was a publishing contract. But when they learned that he was a prisoner, they withdrew the publishing contract because they said, well, you can't promote your book, um, and we won't make money off of it. So it was actually, I believe the award was given to someone else. Uh, for that reason. So he's he's run into a lot of obstacles, but he's just really incredibly artistic with his with his writing and with his drawing and with his poetry. But to me, what George has accomplished that's even more remarkable than that is that George is actually happy. Um, like if you ask him about happiness and how one finds happiness. George consistently says that he is happier now having served 15 years on death row than he's ever been in his life. And that's really what has always surprised me the most about him and what I find the most fascinating. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship, and I'm not saying this in this kind of bullshit way. I don't care about money. Of course I care about money. Like I want to go on, on nice holidays to fancy places and like, you know, be very comfortable and buy nice things. Like who doesn't want to do that? Like I absolutely love all those things. But when the outcome becomes the money, then I feel completely drained. Simon, look what you're doing. Like you're talking about starting a tea company. It's like, of course you want to be a healer. You know, I think that I'm very lucky and blessed to be in a business where every, you know, product that we sell, every box of product where we know for a fact that like it's doing good for somebody. Psychology of entrepreneurship. I interviewed George Wilkerson because he is an award-winning writer, artist, and poet, currently incarcerated for 14 years on North Carolina's death row for a double homicide in 2005. In 2018, he won a Penn Award for his essay, Lim Grey Fur, was a finalist for the Kathy Smith Bowers Chapbook Contest, and won a gold award in the Capitalizing on Justice art competition. In addition to being editor for Compassion, a newsletter for people on death row, his work has appeared in multiple 
philanthropic platforms and exhibitions, including Hidden Voices, The Upper Room, The Marshall Project, Windows on Death Row, The Corrections Accountability Project, and Lifelines Collective. In 2019, he was a finalist for an Ellie Award. George is an artist of limitless talent. His poetry, artwork, and drawings are all national award winners. He is a brilliant storyteller and a deeply spiritual person. He loves to talk about the power of storytelling to change hearts and minds. You can find links to more of his writing in the show notes at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kaylee Bonniman and Tiago Vega. Guest research by Jenna Elliott. Content by Corin Castles. Project managed by the legend that is Kaylee Bonniman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and way to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Love the polished audio docu-series style of this podcast, The Psychology of Entrepreneurship? At We Are Podcast, you can learn how to create a similar style for your own show. This revolutionary virtual event assembles podcasters, entrepreneurs, and marketers in one spot, so you're able to learn from the masters. Head straight to wearepodcast.com to reserve your spot at our next event. Are you still listening? Here's a little gift to you for sticking around. If you are on Clubhouse, already on Clubhouse, we have the Psychology of Entrepreneurship Club that we regularly, that we regularly, that we regularly run. (laughs) 